Hello and welcome to the Everything Is Black and White podcast. It's time for episode five of Just Take Three with me, Andrew Musgrove, and me, Sam Mulliner. How are we doing, Sam? You well? Good. I am. I've calmed. Um, I've calmed. I, I got swept up in the animosity of the atmosphere of St. James's Park on Saturday. I, I got swept up in it and um, great to get off to a win. I did warn you it wasn't going to be straightforward. I didn't quite expect that though. Um, but yeah, great back, back against the wall win and um, fantastic effort. Defended like lions. Yes, we did. And it's fair to say, though, if we were doing the last episode of Just Take Three, which was opening day victories, that game against Southampton most certainly would not make it onto the list because it was not one to remember. But as you just said there, backs to the wall, fantastic team performance and getting three points is all that matters. And then you were outside of the ground, Sam, at full time with Newcastle fans TV doing your last words. You ignored mm. me as I passed. With Mick Quinn as well, not just me. I was with Mick I Quinn. I didn't even Castle realize you were with Mick Quinn. No, you tapped oh, me on the shoulder. You, you I didn't was even interested. Break, you didn't even break stride to stop and say hello. You literally tapped me on my shoulder, stuck your hand out, so we had an awkward handshake, and then you just carried on walking. You didn't even stop to like say hello on the video. You could have brought Mick Quinn in on the video, but no, you just. I was obviously beneath you that day because you were suited and booted, and I what I was I wasn't. So mm, no, no, I was looking. It says more to about you, you actually than it does about me. I'm glad I bumped into you. I just didn't want to interrupt what was a fantastic last word. Go back and watch it if you haven't already. I'm on your Castle Fans TV. It was great to see you and the whole gang together. Um, so it was nice to see you on Tyneside. Maybe for the Spurs game, I'll come out and we'll grab a coffee. And you never know, we could do this in person, maybe. Yeah. You, uh, yes. I am. I, like I say, I am a professional broadcaster now. I have more time to do these things. Reach PLC, cover my expenses. I'll, uh, I'll come up whenever you want, mate. <laughs> Put the claim in. <laughs> I've also got some devastating, sad news because I know you're a fan of your kits, Sam, and your training gear and all that. You've seen the new Adidas jumper, right? The black one. Yes, I um, I had to go into the club shop and actually get one for Carl on, <sighs> from NFTV on Saturday. Tell oh, me, yeah. you didn't buy a medium? I think I did get him a medium. Actually, I've I've gone today. Look, I've I've restrained myself from buying any of the new stuff. But that jumper I am in love with, I've gone today, they've only got large upwards. And I put the large one on thinking, could I get away with it? It looks like a dress. Good. Absolutely good. So I'm going to have to go up every day checking they've got new stock in because uh, I'm I quite love that. surprised um, the kind of lack of stock they have of that range because it's immediately as you go in and it's only a small rail and that but it's not just the jumpers there it's the it's the kind of jackets as well there's not many of them at all so you I mean sure you can just order it online yeah yeah i'm gonna have to most probably you've got loads in jd sports but um the rest of the, the kit the rest of the shops kitted out um really really well and so popular i mean there were queues around the the club shop on Saturday, and I've gone in there, and you're queuing for like 20 minutes before you get the till, which is fantastic to see everything so popular. And of course, we'll add to the purse, the wallet of the club going forward, which is fantastic. Um, we've got into today's episode. You've picked this one, Sam. So, what are we going for? Um, kind of, I mean, I mean, I originally said to you like uh, bad boys, but um, I think lovable rogues is more appropriate. The kind of um. Players who are a bit naughty on the pitch, but you can't help but love them anyway. Hmm. And I have to admit, I've struggled with this one, uh, really, because I think if we were doing this, having watched the 60s, 70s and 80s, and we would have been able to fill a list of about 10 or 15. But for our generation, it's a little bit different. You know, the term lovable rogue is, is probably not what, what it once was. The term bad boys is not, you know, it doesn't have the same definition as it did 30, 40 years ago. So... I've got one man down on, on this list, which I, I think both of us might have. And then I think it's probably just going to be picking the other two kind of when it comes to it. Because I've got I've got a few a few names, but I think it's more going to be an interpretation of that definition of lovable rogues. Um, so I'm going to be intrigued to see who you've got. Uh, I'm, I'm yeah. going to let you go first on this one. Well, the, the, my first one is just the reason because... I just want to talk about him on the podcast. So that's, this is, I think, the category that best um, describes him. Um, David Batty. 
I love David Batic. I, I I just love David Batic. I've I've got his. I've got that ninety seven ninety eight top. Um, you know where where the number goes in the kind of shield thing on the back. I I have a Batty four top, um, which I'm immensely proud of. Although every time I wear it to a match, we lose two nil. So I've stopped wearing it <laughs> on match days. Uh, it's absolutely true. Villa away, um, Carabao Cup final. Yeah, we all seem to lose two 0 when I wear it, so I, I've stopped wearing it on match days. But um, yeah, David Batty, um, if he played nowadays, he would hardly see a football pitch because he would be permanently suspended. The stuff he used to get away with was absolutely insane. Um, he's had Nicky Butt round the throat. He's um, punched a Met. Was it? It was Met, wasn't it? That he's, 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 yeah. There was an incident there, which was a bit grim. Um, when, if you remember, when Neil Lennon headbutted Alan Shearer's boot, um, and obviously Lennon came off worse from from that um, self-inflicted um, incident. Um, David Batty kind of chucked him off, chucked Lennon off the pitch <laughs> so they could play on. Um, but that, yeah, football. Um, was kind of secondary to David Batty. He was a brilliant family man, a um, bit of a recluse, kept him that you don't see or hear of him or anything nowadays, do you? Which is a bit of a shame, really, because fantastic character. I always remember when he played for England, um, when they'd line up for the national anthem, he'd always wink, smile or wave to, to his kids back at home and whatnot. I, I loved him to bits. I was gutted when he missed that penalty against Argentina. Um, yeah, I, I just love David Batty. Yeah, I'm a big fan of David Bay. I think he gets unfair criticism about that team that lost the title because people say he came in and he was kind of the reason that they lost it, um, mm. which I think is really unfair because, you know, he was a very talented player. He'd won it with Leeds, hadn't he, as well? You know, it wasn't like he was an inexperienced player. Yeah, um, won Division 1 with Leeds, won the Premier League with Blackburn. Blackburn, of course, yeah. So, um, like, so yeah, it was... He scored some absolute great goals as well in his time. Um, it often gets overlooked because it was Shearer's first home game where obviously he scored that free kick. But Batty got the other goal in that game and it was like a 35-yard lob over Neil Sullivan. It was an immense goal. Um, but yeah, yeah, he used to work on the bins when he was uh, playing for leads as well i think coming through through the ranks like division one winning team but he'd go and help his dad or his uncle or something um who was a bin man he'd go and he'd, he'd go and work with him in the mornings it's just great yeah fantastic character and you talk about the goals yeah there was one as you see against Wimbledon. did he score Perla against Nottingham forest as well i'm sure he did I think he did, where... but some of them games i have deleted from my mind palace mainly because of ian Wone. Um, and Steve Stone, and I did tell Steve Stone this when he was on my podcast a couple of years back. Um, but yeah, he, Batty, yeah, he, he didn't score often, but but when he did, bosh. Be interesting to see how he would fit into the modern game. I know you've said there that you would barely see a football pitch he because he'd just be sent he'd be off. Suspended. Well, Can you maybe... imagine if David Batty was Fabian Cher on Saturday? Yes, I can imagine given, what would have happened. It, it would have given Brereton something to lie on the ground about. But in terms of that controlled aggression that he most certainly, probably, hopefully, could have, should have, you know, if he, if he could remove <laughs> the desire and want to just thump a player or, um, or what have you and just have it a little bit controlled, he'd be worth a pretty penny in today's game, wouldn't he? I think so, whether you look at a player like N'Golo Kante, maybe. Someone like that. Um, but with that just kind of psychotic element, which is, 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 is just so... Out of, well, well, it is, because how can such a mild-mannered family man who's so family orientated i remember speaking to warren barton i'm again on my podcast about uh, david batty after training players would all hang around and socialize batty would be straight in his car and back home he wouldn't hang around um for anyone so uh, and yet he had that kind of menace about him on the pitch it, it's and i suppose kante is a bit like that as well very mild-mannered chap isn't he but um absolutely warrior on the pitch so i don't know yeah, what do you think I, about that comparison because i have just pulled it out my backside 
I was going to say that I, I'm not agreeing with you on that comparison. I think, no, um, why not? Well, look, they probably both do the dirty work, you know, stop the opposition from playing by getting their, their foot on the ball. But I can't ever remember seeing Kante uh, be as aggressive as David Batty. I mean, someone's going to correct us in the comments, but, um, you know, he's more of a kind of a runner, wasn't he? And, and a stopper yeah, rather than, the, than a the fighter. the thing is as well, you, you, I made a comparison that you can't really do because, as I say, Batty would struggle to stay on the field especially in the days of VAR, where you can't just cheekily punch someone in the chest. You can't just grab Nicky Butt round the throat when, you know, the ref's not looking. It, it's it's a different, you know, the game has moved on a little bit. Hmm. Yeah, no, it has, um, but it'd still be interesting to see if he indeed could keep himself on the pitch. Now, Batty arrived, as uh, Sam mentioned there, from Blackburn Rovers. Second half of that season, when Newcastle United threw away the uh, 12 point lead at the top of the table. He then played 32 games the season after, 32 games the season after that, eight games in 98 and 99 before returning to Leeds United for around, I think it was 4.5 million. And it was Rude Hullet who sold him on. What more can we say? A man who was a fighter, but I think Kevin Keegan has also gone on record to say that until you work with him day and day on the training pitch, you didn't actually realize that he was a, a much better player than just someone who fought on the pitch. He could pass the ball, he yeah, could strike the you ball. Yeah, you don't get into that England team for, for, for that World Cup for nothing. Yeah, he was, he was a fantastic player. And he probably set the bar in terms of that aggression for, for the list that's to, to come next. But I'm just going to finish off by talking about David Batty by describing that incident versus Mets because as soon as you said David Batty, that's what popped into my head. And there's a... Uh, an image of David Batty just smiling his head off with blood um, pouring down from his uh, eye. And he got in quite the fight. It's it's actually the game when Newcastle didn't have a sponsor because you weren't allowed to have a beer sponsor on your shirt and hadn't yet got centre parks on the shirt. So it was uh, the Newcastle United top without the brown ale sign. But it, where that was, a lovely little red mark of, <laughs> of Batty's blood, which it comes down from his eye after him and uh, their number 10 had, how shall we say, Sam, come together rather in an unfriendly manner. Ah, it was just a bit of banter, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, 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 I love Batty. I, I, I loved, uh, yeah, um, yeah, I mean, in the in the days of VAR now, then, you know, it'll be ta wouldn't it? Um, the main thing as well in that opening World Cup game for England against Tunisia, didn't he like scorpion kick someone in the head? Um, but in like the middle of the pitch, it's it's just like nowadays. I mean, it would be it would be shown on Sky and talked about on Talk Sport every day of the week, and you know, overanalyzed to death. But now you can just look back a bit misty eyed and go, oh, "God, but he was great, wasn't he?" Oh my God, he didn't half kick someone in the face. Sixty sixth minute on the clock. <laughs> Bloody Nora, that is a boot to the face. Yeah. <laughs> Younger listen, listeners and uh, viewers might remember Zhejiang against uh, <laughs> Alonso. That is nothing, ladies and gentlemen. Type in Batty Tunisia and see what comes up. That is a wonderful. Someone described it there as an exquisite boot to the face. It's it's quite the collector's yeah, item. Yeah, it's a thing of beauty. So David Batty, the first name on the list there. Um, let me Surely just remind you how yours as well. Sure. Yeah. Well. But yeah, okay. I mean, I have got a few other people we're going to talk about. This isn't necessarily a list of three. I might, I might whittle it down at the end. This is kind of just passing by. But we'll we'll just remind people of the concept. Me and Sam have landed on a desert island. No means of communication, but somehow we have the ability to watch. We'll somehow have Wi-Fi. Videos. Yeah, don't spoil it. We, we've, it doesn't matter. Someone, I don't know how it's on the island, but it is on the well, island. Stop trying to rip off BBC pastimes. We can... We we can watch the cast night highlight reels of certain things that have happened, certain players, certain goals, certain matches. And as you are well aware, it is lovable rogues this week. And David Batty is the first name on the list. I'm going to go for Alan Shearer. Shearer's not... Oh, he did have a bit of that streak in him, though, at, at times. But I don't think he's... I don't. I wouldn't say he was a rogue. No, he's not a rogue, but... Although, think... 
So then again, you say that, and you've just instantly made me think of a few things now, and you think, oh, that was naughty. Let me let me just define rogue. Okay? Let me just define rogue. A dishonest, unprincipled person. Well, he's not that. An elephant or the large wild animal living apart from the head. And he's also not that. Definitely. Basically, though, I'm just going to kind of, we're calling it lovable rogues, but let's just say bad boys, you know, people with a bit of menace about them. And Alan Shearer had that about him. He wasn't a man who, who you know, shouted about it. He wasn't a man who necessarily think as a hard man. Like Roy Keane, you automatically think hard man. Sam is currently pressing buttons on his phone, which is sending I've thumbs up. I've not pressed a button. I was wondering what was going on. For some you reason, were... there was, there's been two thumbs down by my uh, left ear. And I, I, thought, no I thought you were why. I thought you no. were thumbing I'm down my choice of Alan Shearer. Okay. No, no. Modern technology. Anyway, yes. Alan Shearer, not a man who shouted about his menace. Um, not like Roy Keane, who you, you all might think is just one of those bad boy characters. Maybe a, little, a bit like David Batty. But you, you certainly did not want to get on the wrong side of Alan Shearer. You went about his business very quietly. And you knew that if you crossed him, he would let you know about it. Roy Keane found that out, didn't he? When he uh, lost his rag and tried to punch him and Shearer stood his ground and then was waiting for him inside the tunnel. Neil Lennon, as you uh, mentioned, found that out. But he was just Alan Shearer, a man who knew how to handle himself. And when called upon, if he needed to show that bit of aggression and he needed to defend the teammate, he needed to defend himself, he would do it. But also he would do it in other ways that didn't require maybe a slap or a tickle or a push. He did it by kind of scoring goals. I always remember that Grimsby game when he got an elbow to the face from the defender just in down in Cleethorpes. And um, he was left with a really nasty gash when he, uh, up, over his lip. And he came out full time and he said, I could have gone out and sorted him out but I kind of let my feet do the talk, and I think she was scored in that second half, at least one goal anyway. And that's that's kind of the other side of the coin, you know. You know he could have handled himself. You know he could have gone and got revenge physically, but he didn't. He did it in the best way possible, and he did it by scoring a goal. But you know you don't mess with Alan Shearer. No, you don't. It's the quiet ones you've got to watch, isn't it? Because they're the ones that will give you a, a, a chuffing good hiding. Um I remember as well in the Champions League, he got a, re a retrospective ban for a, a big elbow on Cannavaro. Um, yeah, no, no, you got a, you've, made, you've got a good point there actually, because I never would have even considered putting Alan she Shearer into into this. But yeah, no, I I, I like your points, but yeah, it was he's just an old school, no nonsense. Yeah. Man's man, I suppose you would you would you would say. You you would want him in the uh, trenches, I think. You know, oh, because you have your I mean, back. Yeah, I mean, got a very good right hook to him as well. If you ask Keith Gillespie, um, which which is a, another kind of incident that would that would put a stakey claim to your point. Are you aware of that one? Because you're looking puzzled. Go on. Do you not know about this? The the team night out in Ireland. Oh yes, in in Dublin. Now you is that right? Was it in Dublin? Yeah, where he knocked yeah. out Keith Gillespie with one punch. Yes, and, I've uh, I've heard the, I've heard the Steve Howie uh, story of it. Yes, yes. yes. Um, I mean, it's it's online. I don't think I would do it justice, but yeah, he's, um, yeah. Um, charity boxing match between Big Al and Roy Keane would be good. Yeah, it would. Oh, I, I mean, the there's only one winner. Big, big Al. It's amazing, oh, yeah. you know. People, people look back at that incident, and especially the the red side of Manchester coming to the verdict that Shearer was scared of Roy Keane, and he could not be further from the truth. Like you look at that, you look at his face. He's just controlled, and he's waiting, and he's ready. Roy Keane absolutely rattled, lost his rag. Like yeah, Shearer all day long. Tremendous uh, player, tremendous leader, and definitely someone that has got your back. Uh, and we saw that on Saturday, you know, against Southampton, where everyone had each other's backs. And back in the day when Shearer was playing, he was right at the front of that. You know, the team is united, and it was largely down to Alan Shearer and his leadership. So I'm surprised he didn't get on this list for you, but I guess that's because we can interpret the title in, in many different ways. 
Yeah, no, it's it's, it's a very good point. I I usually thoroughly enjoy arguing against you and putting you back in your box, but no, no, I, 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 yeah, good one. You only got, well, you got two red cards in the Premier League, but one was choked off. So the other one was against Aston Villa. Do you remember it? And it was a red card that should not have been a red card. It was, if I'm not mistaken, it was, uh, uh, he, he goes for the header against, I think it's Ian Taylor. Was that, was that right? Um, uh, yeah. And, you, and um, somehow he's, he's sent off for a headbutt. And I mean, <laughs> perfect in today's modern game then. But it was uh, it was not a red card um, that should have stood. But I do think that's the only red card he got in the Premier League for Newcastle United. If I'm not mistaken. Because he did get one against him. Charlton, but it was chalked off. So, um, none, yeah, yeah. None, yeah, nothing springs to mind. You just knew how to get away with it, maybe. A little dig here and there. Yeah, he was an expert at that. Yeah, it was Uriah Rennie against Aston Villa who, uh, who gave him the, the red card. But there you go. Alan Shearer is uh, my first name on the list of Lobo Rogue slash Bad Boy slash people who could just handle themselves on a football pitch. Who's uh, your second name, Sam? Uh, would be a teammate of David Batty. I'm going for Tino Espria. Oh, okay, okay. I mean, we are stretching. I mean, that is that is much more lovable rogue than Alan Shearer. Tino was a rogue, wasn't he? Um, it just the amount of Tino stories that you that you've got uh, when you speak to the to those players who who played with him. Um, I remember Alan Shearer telling a story of of him of Tino shouting outside of his house at stupid o'clock one morning after he'd been on, out on the town all night. Um, was it Lee Clark that told me, or was it Warren Barton, one of the two anyway, about um, he'd just been given a car when he'd been signed, uh, when we signed him, and then he's literally just gone out and smashed it to bits straight away. Comes back in with the keys, puts them on the desk and says, Tino needs a new car. Uh, obviously, famous story, He'd, he, he'd had a glass of wine or two before his debut as well, coming off the bench at Borough. Just, but he, you know, didn't get as many goals as he maybe should have done for Newcastle, but obviously always be fondly remembered for that hat-trick against Barcelona and just those those moments that he could produce. Um, yeah, I, 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 I mean, look, there's something about us as, as Newcastle fans and, and, you know, we like a bit of crazy. Um Tino was crazy. So how how could you not? How could you not love him? Yeah, I always remember the day he signed and he he's in on tie inside in the middle of a snowstorm with a letter print fur coat, signing autographs, and proper coming down thick was the snow. And then his was it his first game against the Middlesbrough and he's sitting on the bench um with a translator behind him and he comes on and he absolutely embarrasses the full back with a cheeky little Kind of cry forward face and turn. It was a it was a wonderful bit of trickery and skill. He changed yeah. that game, if I remember correctly. Crossed it in yeah. for Steve Watson, didn't he? The cross, but very entertaining character. Um, his goal scoring record probably isn't as good as it as it should have been. Um, I think mm. he's probably more remembered for that kind of entertainment factor than anything else because. For the money he cost and the goals he scored, obviously he's got them three against Barcelona, and that's enough to put anyone into folklore. But you know, nine goals in forty-eight games. Yeah, it's not great. Not really good enough, is it, for a man who cost? But he's really fondly remembered. remembered. Yeah, he is. He is, um, and that, that that's really nice. And like you say, you can't look, really ask for any more than that hat against Barcelona. But yeah, someone who had a bit of a temper and a bit of bite about him. He got. He got it. Did he get it? Got sent off against Man City, Man did City. he, for a headbutt? Yeah. Was it him and Keith Curl? I think it might have been, you know. That's, that's mean, a that's... good memory. Yeah. Um, And I can't, I think Newcastle and I won top on that game. Not Was that the three-all one? Was that when Albert scored twice? It may have, no, I, no, I don't, I don't think so off the top of my head. Um, let me just have a, a quick deeks. But that, that that's the kind of the spark that um that I remember. And I've just read a quote here from Keith Curl. I knew Aspria had had a suspect temperament, so I was in his face from the moment we kicked off. 
Yep. Um, and uh, he got exactly what he was after. Tino Aspria getting a little bit uh, angry and then giving him something to think about. But yeah, um, I don't think it was a 3-3. Uh, it doesn't say here, but I could be I could be wrong. But uh, yeah. Was it not? I'm sure it was the same year. But I, I don't seem to remember the highlights being at dark and at night. Um, but anyway, I've got another quote here um, from Keith Curl. My initial reaction to getting his elbow flush in my face was, well, that hurt. I went down on my haunches, but I didn't go down. My next thought was the next time he goes to the ball, I'm going to end this afternoon for him. I was going to level him no matter what. Had the elbow been seen properly by the officials, it was a red card day all along, but he hadn't, so I was going to take matters into my own hands. After that, he was mindful of what was going to happen next and was selective in the balls he did and didn't go for. Just as well, because I would have cleaned him out if he had. <laughs> Compare that with Ben Brereton. I was going to say, yeah. Uh, and then two minutes later, um, I think Sydney get the equaliser um, from that elbow. But yeah, maybe. Was it, maybe was it, it might have been Niall Quinn, actually, who got that equaliser. Or was it Juve Rosler? I do remember I Quinn. But anyway, and then as Curl and Aspie, I went for a ball deep and out of time. The Colombian short fuse again blew, and he, <laughs> he and the city skipper squared up. Aspia clearly butted Curl, but the linesman almost stood in between. With the linesman almost stood in between. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I do remember that game, actually. I can't remember what the score was, but I remember Aspia losing his uh, his cool there. And as you might have be able to guess, those quotes and words are from a Man City website, the official Man City website, because they are very heavily weighted in the favour of Keith Curl, who uh, you might argue wound, a bit like Brian Diaz did, Wound the uh, the Newcastle United player up and should not have been surprised when he got a little tickle. Tino Aspria, though, yeah, wonderful memories. I've only could have scored a few more goals, but we have got those three against Barcelona. Now, my next pick. You see, because the interpretation of Liverpool Rogues, I think, is very broad. Again, I'm going to pick someone who isn't necessarily a rogue, because I think a rogue is, is a little bit rude and a little bit insulting to, to you know, as we discussed, no, Shearer. No, 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 it's, it's prefixed with lovable. How can that be insulting? True, true. But again, I've gone for someone who you definitely just want in the trenches with you, someone who has your back, someone who's a leader and a captain and who could handle themselves. And I've gone for Kevin Nolan. I just always remember Kevin Nolan just having a bit of bite about him, backing his teammates up, you know, could give as good as he could, uh, give as good as he got. Um, and just, again, another another leader of the team. You would never leave anyone behind. Yeah. It's a, it's a difficult think, category. Did, no, no, no. No, do you know what? I did. He, he entered my calculation. Uh, did Nolan. Um, signed at the worst possible time. Um, and stayed with us when we went down, of course. And, um, yeah, the, the whole thing about being in the trenches. I remember when we were 5 nil up against Sunderland. Um. Sunderland had a bit of a half chance and Kevin Nolan came back to the defence and goalkeeper and fired a round of Fs into him saying, you know, not to that, like, stay switched on. I mean, obviously we went on to concede anyway, but it didn't really matter. But, you know, the, the attempt to that was, to, was there and, like, he did not want to concede a goal and to keep everyone switched on for the remainder of the game despite being 5-0 up. Um, yeah, I, 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 I don't mind Nolan at all. Um Scored some very, very big goals for us um, and was fantastic in the championship season. Uh, would we have gone straight back up without him? Arguably not. Hmm. Tricky one, isn't it? Um, but yeah, I, 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 I don't, disagree, don't disagree with you put having him on your top three. I think he's absolutely crucial to that championship season and the first uh, season up as well. Um, I absolutely love him. I was good when he left. Yeah, I was really good. Yeah, when it he was asked a shame. It was a shame, but um, you know, had and we would have felt the effects of it more had you know his replacement not been Johan Kabai. Yeah, very, very true. You remember his his first sending off for Newcastle, Kevin Owen? Come on, was you must it? know this one. It's against Everton for a two foot foul on Victor Anishibi. Oh. Anishibi. Sugar puffs, yes, yes, yes. Because he barely yes. played. I think he'd been injured, had he not, um, Nolan? And then he'd gone in maybe a little bit undercooked. 
to the game and then ended up, um, hitting hitting War Victor and getting a red card for it. Definitely a red card. As that was a short and sweet one, let me deliver my third one and then I'll let you go in with your two, okay? I'm going to jump in the head of the queue because okay. I feel like I need to save myself this week. Okay. Alan Wilson. And I'll tell you for why, okay? Because I can see your face and you're thinking, why Callum Wilson? If Callum Wilson was an opposition player doing what he does week in, week out for Newcastle United when fit, I would hate him. I think he is one of those players that you, you just must hate as an opposition player. Not because of the goals he scores, and goodness knows he is a goal scorer, but just the way he winds the defence up, you know, and it's little elbows, it's little digs, it's little, you know, words in the ears. He's very, very good at getting every single advantage, i.e. winding the opposition up. And every time I watch him play, which admittedly hasn't been often in recent months, I just sit there and think, he's got this absolutely down to a T. And if he was on the other side, I would despise him. You know, I kind of always think, you know, he's an annoyance, but he's our annoyance because I just, I just watch him and think, He's got this. He's, he's mastered this. The act of... Uh, is it shithousery? I want a better phrase. Oh, no need to F and Jeff. Okay, within that term, sorry. You have to is beat it... that outreach, PLC. Yeah, I should do it again with it. Um, no, keep it in. Um, no, what would I you mean... call it, though? What would you call it? Uh, antics. Antics? It feels like it needs a bit more of a... Than that. Oh, right. it's shithousery. Jesus. Um... Yeah, yeah. I, I really like that uh, one because I didn't think of it. Um, yeah, when when you first said Callum Wilson uh, and you know the topic lovable rogue, I thought it was more about the teacher that uh, he said he fancied in the documentary. Um, but yeah, he does that old school centre forward stuff really well, and he's got such uh, that banter and personality about him to really wind people up, but not in a obviously nasty way. He, it, it's it's kind of like the way he says it. It's, it's almost in the right spirit, but it still does the job. Um, I didn't realise how good he was until we signed him. Um, yeah, with, it, it's such a shame. I've, yes, the frustration last season boiled over with some... Uh, with, with, the fan base and, and maybe wanting to sell him. I don't blame them. Um, that's not my point of view, but I, I certainly don't, don't blame them as well because it's so frustrating not to have him fit for most of the season. And it's obviously a recurring theme with him. When he is fit, and I, uh, like you say, he is absolutely immense. And oh, yeah, just a really, really talented striker. And it's a shame. It's a shame he's he's so injury plagued because um, he saved us under Steve Bruce, really himself and St Maximin. And you think, well, can he be the one to to help lead a charge towards the Champions League? And along with Alexander Isak, we saw amazing competition between those two. It's not like one really. I know Isaac is obviously the class act and could go on to be, you know, really, really world class. Um, and you know, I wouldn't be selling Isaac for anything less than one hundred and fifty million at least. Um, but Wilson did so much, scored a lot of goals, um, in from off the bench, and yeah, he's um, yeah, he has that personality. So yeah, I, I, I agree. Yeah, I think when we look back, you know, in ten years' time. And if we are doing podcasts and we're still asking each other what the biggest regret is of uh, 30 years of supporting Newcastle United, obviously we'll talk about the title going under Keegan. Uh, we might talk about that game against Everton when Ollie Bernard gets wiped out by Gravison and the referee doesn't give a free kick and everything go up and score in Newcastle's title race. And I say Bobby is over. Talk about Woodgate getting injured in the UEFA Cup semi-final after Mark and Drogba at the first leg. We could talk about loads of things. I'd say I'd say Dyer getting injured as well at Lisbon. Yeah, plenty of things, plenty of things. Mike Ashley buying the club. But one of the things that will will be at the top of my list is that we never got to see a fully fit Callum Wilson. Look at his goals record and how many games he's missed. You know, we talk about where Shearer could be in terms of. The games he missed because he missed two or three seasons through injury. You've got to remember that, you yeah. know. And I'm not saying Callum Wilson would be anywhere near Shearer's record, 
but he would certainly be looking at maybe 120, 130 goals. Uh, he'd be well in the top 10 of the all-time Premier League goal scorers to me. It's a massive regret. I've obviously got no power over it, no control over it, but not to see Callum Wilson have three or four or five seasons without a single injury is one of those things I'll always think, what if? Because a tremendous, tremendous player. And I just, I love the scores he scores. And I just love the way he smiles when he's winding people up. His, his, his Celebrations his at West Ham as well, because um, he had that ongoing thing with Mikel Antonio when they had their own pod, didn't they? Um, which was great fun to listen to. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's great that he's on our side. Hmm. But you know, Alexander, he's acts like that as well. He's got a bit of bit of spice about him. You Did saw you that. See him with Brereton after the yeah. Uh, yeah, and, I mean... Sean, and Sean Longstaff as well getting stuck in. That was great yeah. to see. That was cheered louder than the goal. It was. It was. Yeah, I enjoyed Isaac's kind of shoulder punch. Um, a bit of an, an interesting way to get your own that back on. Burn in the and tunnel as well. Go on, Dan. Tremendous, tremendous. But um, yeah, Callum Wilson, maybe a surprise pick for some, maybe not. But for me, I just love the fact he winds opposition players up. And I, I stand by it. If he was on the other side, he'd be one of my most hated players. But because he's ours, I love him a bit. Cool. Agreed. Um, so... My final one. Well, I'll tell you the one that's just missed out first. The one that's just missed out is Tamiri Kespaya. Okay. Because, um, you know, again, lovable nutter, Zagreb, great. Um, kicking the hoardings and all that carry on. The one I've gone for is the one professional footballer who we didn't really see his best. But when guys that you've had in yours, like Shearer, don't mess with him, you know... He's not to be effed with, and that is big dunk Ferguson. Yeah, okay. He, you you just don't you just don't mess with him. So, plain and simple. Um, I thought he was a good signing for us at, 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 the, at the time when I was uh, a kid, and um, I thought it was quite shrewd. Yeah, obviously. It's probably his best moment in a Newcastle shirt was that 3-0 win over Man United and, and that amazing um, volley on the spin. Um, but, yeah, on the pitch, an absolute... I think beast is the wrong word because I think beasts would be intimidated by Duncan Ferguson. Um, but, yeah, he's just... You, you don't you don't mess with Duncan Ferguson. Yeah, I you're one hundred percent correct, and a couple of uh, intruders at his home found that out, didn't they? Uh, Jimmy Bullard also found that out. Um, I remember, um, or did one of Jimmy, Jimmy Bullard's teammates find that out? And then Jimmy Bullard, his expression um, was, that was kind hilarious. of hilarious. Like, a little bit of a hilarious. grimace, a bit of what's going on here. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, hilarious. And the one there's a, Shearer tells the the story of of the day um, after the Sunderland game. Um, quite famously, how we, you know, drop the kids off early to school, go in and, you know, I'm going to have it out with, with Rude Hullet. Um, and this is always the part of the story, which, which obviously Alan wasn't there for it, but he got in there and Big Dunk was already in, had beaten him to it and was tearing strips off the wall. You never hear about what actually went on there. No one, I've not heard, like, Rude or, or Big Dunk or anyone... Because I'm sure that they wouldn't be the only two in the training ground. I'm sure Steve Clark was in and around there somewhere. Um, you never hear about what went on between Rude and Big Dunk. You only hear about Alan coming in a bit later and and missing his chance to get his, his two pence worth in. But I would love to have been a fly on the wall when Rude Hullet was facing uh, a, an absolutely steaming... Duncan Ferguson, um, that would have been interesting. Yeah, it most certainly, um, because both were very angry ha having been left out of the team that lost Sunderland in the pouring rain the night before, and that turned out to be Hullard's last game in charge, pretty much because he totally underestimated the feeling towards the game against Sunderland. But yeah, I, I agree with you in terms of you know him being a good buy at the time. I think actually, when we talk about what might have been it's another one that's in that category. I, I think a lot of people actually maybe forget his time on Tyneside and what could have yeah. been with Alan Shearer. You know, they were a, a decent partnership. Um, obviously, 
Ferguson suffered a, an injury, which meant he only played seven times in that 1998-99 season, which obviously wasn't great. Um, and then obviously he headed back to Everton in the year 2000. Newcastle United lost quite a bit of money on him, actually. But in terms of his character, yeah, you, you are you are right. I mean, you know, defenders mm. must have hated going up against him, not only because he was tricky and good in the air and, you know, it's good control for a big man. genuinely terrifying. Yeah, but he's, yeah, exactly. He, he puts the frighteners on you, doesn't he? So... Yeah, you wouldn't want to mess with them at all. And there was still Even a when there was that there. viral video that went um, that went round um, when he recorded, I think it was in and around the time he was maybe putting caretaker charge of Everton. Um, and he was recording a lovely message to a young fan going through their, their exams or something, and it was supposed to be nice. And that was utterly terrifying as well. Um, but <laughs> it's just so funny. <laughs> He um, must play up to it, though. He must play up to oh, it. I hope so. I hope so. Um, I'm sure he's a lovely bloke. Uh, well, apparently he is. Um, and, of course, his son sp- uh, spent time in, in our academy as well, Cameron Ferguson. He's, he's no uh, no longer at the club. Game, But, um, yeah, I, I, yeah I, I know he's more associated with Everton and whatnot. But, I, 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 yeah, I like Big Dunk. Yeah, no, he gets on the list. Um, and that's it, ladies and gents. Lovable rogues with a bit of bad boys and whatever interpretation you want to put in when it comes to bad boys, lovable rogues and players who could handle themselves on the pitch. It's a bit of a broad one this week, but lots of fun. And I do think if you were stuck on a desert island thinking, I've had enough crab, I would really just like some clean drinking water without having to filter it and boil it first, if you've managed to create a fire, that is. You know, watching a bit of aggression on the football pitch, these gents fighting for their club, fighting for the fans, fighting for their teammates, it would it would please you somewhat, I think. Well, if you were stuck on a desert island watching clips of Duncan Ferguson, it would ease fear levels somewhat because you would just think, <laughs> well, nothing that's on this desert island with me will ever be as scary as Duncan Ferguson. Yeah, a little bit of rustling in the overgrowth and you're thinking, well, it, it's it probably just, just a wild matter. ball. At least it's not big dunk. Exactly, exactly. And then do you know what? It might have the the the, the motivational impact as well, where you think, do you know what? I can do this. I want to go mm. and catch that wild boar. I'm going to cook it, and then I'm going to watch these highlights reel with a lovely bit of wild boar. Pretend it's Nicky Butt and you're David Batty, and just grab it around his throat. Or the Mets player in it. Or the Mets player. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if we should have put a warning on there. Was that too graphic? No, I don't know. It's not like you to get carried away. Anyway, cue the smooth jazz if you're listening to the pod. He's got it down to a T. Ladies and gents, hit thumbs up on the video on YouTube. Give us a rate and review here on the old channel. And actually, you know what, Sam? We were going to call it a day there, but I feel like I need to read a comment out that we got on the last week's episode, which was a very, very bizarre comment. Do you know the one I'm going to read out? Yeah, why are you bringing it up? No, should we not? Well, we said it now. Well, if you really want to. No, we'll leave it. We'll let the people go and decide. You go back to the last the last video in episode and, and just have a little bit of a read. It's a bit of a strange comment, wasn't it? Very odd. I, yeah. The, 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 yeah, the, yeah, very odd. Clearly Funny, Sam, but very odd. Sam was very rattled by it that he doesn't want to No, not it. at all. I, I did. Funny, but just very odd. Hmm. Well, thanks for that comment. If you're going to leave a comment on YouTube, maybe leave a bit of a, a nicer one next time. But I hope you've enjoyed the episode. I mean, Sam, we'll see you guys next week.